Hello, everybody. I'm Dave Carter from TCM. Welcome to this conversation with pretty much everybody who worked on Licorice Pizza. That's actually not true, but I am happy to be here with five members of the cast and crew of this instant classic. So let me introduce them real fast. The costume designer, two-time Academy Award winner, Mark Bridges. The winners of this year's Breakthrough Performer Award from the National Board of Review, Alana Hyam and Cooper Hoffman. A Screen Actors Guild Award nominee for this very movie, as well as an eight-time Academy Award nominee, Bradley Cooper. And the writer, director, and producer, also an eight-time Oscar nominee, Paul Thomas Anderson. Hello to all of you. Great to see you all on my screen. Paul, for those of us who love your movies, it's always so fascinating to see what you decide to explore as far as time period and tone and setting. I'm curious, after Phantom Thread, people may know this story, Licorice Pizza, is based on the unique childhood of Gary Getzman, one-time young actor turned waterbed salesman, now big producer. <laughs> um, how many other ideas were bouncing around in your head and how did this one win out? Um, that's a great question. And there was a few my instincts kept pulling me to this one um, or, and, and, or uh, my instinct was also pulling me away from it saying, well, I've done films in the Valley of, I've, I've done films in the seventies, but it, it, there's a certain point when a story has a, a, a power over you and that, and you have to listen to that. It's impossible to fight that you indulge in it and you listen to where you're getting pulled and the thought of being able to be in this world with my family, with, Alana Cooper and the opportunity uh, opportunities that I saw within the story to also, you know, scratch itches to work with Bradley, to work with Sean, other op, uh, op, uh, actors. It just became powerfully overwhelming and, and, and I'm, and I'm all the better for it. Thank God it went that way. Mark, as people know, you're one of the very few people that have worked with Paul on each and every one of his movies. This is the ninth. You guys have worked together for 20 years what makes this partnership and relationship work so well from your point of view? I am just really inspired by the stuff that Paul gives me. You know, you'll hear whether it's uh, we're going to do 70s pinch on or we're going to do a fashion movie or we're going to do about porn stars in the valley. Uh, you know, how could you not be excited about that? And then I, I love the way that Paul brings me into that world, whether we're looking at photo essays or we're looking at music and, and you're allowed to sort of dream and go off and bring back tangible garments and run them by him and find out what he's thinking. And, and it's, it's all very inspired and, and what I love to do most. He just continues to include me in the uh we the try show. to make a lot of time for date nights as well but we don't we we try to make the relationship work we you know true true, true. It's, it's, time it's harder, harder and harder it gets harder and kids. harder for sure exactly. but we spend a lot of time at your office and 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 listen to music and look at movies and i see what's turning you on and then i go away and and kind of run with that or try to interpret it i mean it's it's been a really fun ride Alana, you were born in the early 90s, um, but you clearly, have, you clearly have an affection for the 70s. I mean, you can hear it in the music that you make with your sisters and obviously with the, the, the fashion, it seems to resonate with you too. Why is that, do you think? Why do you think you like this time period so much? I've just always been drawn to it. I don't know. I think growing up in the Valley and also listening to Kareth 101 every day, that was what me and my siblings and my parents did. And it always played 70s music. And when it came to us writing music, it just kind of came out of us because we were so influenced by it growing up. So when Paul, uh, when I found out that Licorice Pizza was in the 70s, I was very up for it. I was like, come on, give it to me. Let's go. I want to be in the 70s. I've been waiting for this moment my whole life. Um, and it was great. I loved it. Yeah. Cooper, I'm curious to know what your history with Paul and his family was obviously you've gotten to know him you know for almost the entirety of your life i would imagine how how close were you with with his family um and him before you started working together on this 
I don't really have a word to describe the relationship I have with Paul, but it, it's it's incredibly close. It's like family. Like all of his kids are like brothers and sisters to me. Uh, Maya's like a second mom. You know, it's it's a very close um, relationship I have with him and everybody in the family. What was it like then to see that relationship kind of morph into a, a working relationship as well? What, did it ever feel weird? You're not showing up to hang out with Paul. You're showing up to do a job and do a job well that you have to do well. And um, so of course it's different, but it was so nice because you have so much trust in him not to steer you the wrong way not to, you know, take advantage of you or whatever it is. I had full faith and trust in Paul that he would, that he would just teach me. And also he fortunately gave me this immense, you know, great opportunity. And uh, I think it's a different relationship, but because of our past, it made it so much more comfortable and made me feel like I could be vulnerable in front of him and everyone that was around me. I think that was the best part. Mm. Bradley, I'm dying to know what the pitch was from Paul to you. Was it, was it, here's the script, read it, and then we'll talk later. Or did he say, I have this idea. It's you as John Peters. What, like how, what was the first way that you found out that this could be a reality for you? And what was your reaction to it? I think it was, I saw Paul Thomas Anderson come up on my phone. I answered saying yes. <laughs> I get it. That's about it. <laughs> okay. So then when did you realize what the part was and how? He called me and um, I, 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 and I, I would open up a door on any, any, anything for him. And, uh, but I did say, let me just read it just to make sure that I think I could, you know, that I think that I can help you uh, give you what you want or what you're looking for. And, uh, and that, and that was, but I, you know, and then that was it. And then um, luckily timing worked out. It was the greatest experience of my life. Really. It was just amazing to be with Adam Sumner and, and Paul's crew and Colin Anderson and Mike Bauman and Mark, who Mark and I worked together in Silver Linings Playbook. And just to be around this world is just incredible. I mean, the way he makes the movie is the way, is the really the, is the best way to make a movie. It's the village, you got your crew, it's small, you're mobile, you're agile, you can call audibles whenever you want. It's just like, it, it's just incredible. And then being with Cooper and Alana, it was just a, and I was lucky because I got to work in the first day of shooting. So it was as if normally when you have such a small role, you're, you're coming when everybody's already downstream, but we all hopped in the boat together, which I was very lucky to be a part of that. Yeah. So this, so Alana and Cooper, this was how you started the shoot it was with this sequence. Oh yeah. no. Way. Uh -huh. Well, a lot of what was, how did that feel when you heard that was going to be happening? Nervous, <laughs> but excited. I mean, what a way to start off my first movie, you know, we were, we were really just diving in head first, um, but it was great. I mean, seeing Bradley come out as John Peters in the first 10 minutes of being on set was a, a memory that I will never forget. And Bradley, you were also just incredible. So you, re you really did you know, bond me and Cooper together in this, in this crazy John Peters chaos. <laughs> I love that. I remember this was a fun story. So like Paul had this thing where he didn't want us to like meet, meet him, like meet them. Right. Or like say hello at all. And I was like, okay, okay. And then there was like, I think it was day two. We're like setting up that whole gas station shot. And I just saw Paul like go away and like, I just like scurried up to them. Like, Hey guys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Bradley. Hey, we met before. I don't know if you remember. Alana, we were at Glastonbury. Okay, see. Okay, bye. And then right back into John Peters. Yeah. Paul, did you notice that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I listened to the whole thing on headphones and pretended I didn't notice. I said, well, you know, I'll let him have it. Paul heard and saw everything. If you did, it, like, there was no getting out of it. Like, it was insane. Paul knows all. He knows Paul all. He's all. It's a funny thing, you know, when, you, when you're scheduling a film, normally you, you think, well, let's start with something just to get our feet wet. And this is, this is a very intelligent way to approach it generally. You know, it gives everybody to kind of shake some rust off or shake their nerves off. And there are times when the schedule and an availability of, of an actor um, requires that you jump in the, in the very deep end of a freezing cold pool. And... I'll tell you, learning from the experience of how this went, I would do it again this way. The benefits of it were so large. You just felt everybody like they were filming. We were filming something like that was so like filming live music. You know, there's one opportunity to get it. There's a high degree of difficulty, high degree of concentration and energy. And I couldn't think of any better way. I never would have done this if it hadn't have been for the necessity of shooting Bradley first. 
And it just became this incredible blessing to start this ship sailing off in this way. It really lit a beautiful fire underneath the whole thing. And I mean fire in a good way, just like sort of just propelling us forward. And if we made it through these kind of five or six days of John Peter's kind of hell that it was going to be, that you could really feel that you, 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 you did something quite strong early on that gave you confidence. And it sent a, a very strong, a high watermark for the quality of work that would come. Honestly, I would, I would do it again like that intentionally. You know, it's, it's, there's something to be learned from it. It's great. Cooper, you, it must have been comforting to know that for both you and Alana, this was a first time doing this, right? I mean, I can imagine it would have, I would stress me out if my co-star was someone who had made 10 movies already. Oh, of course. Yeah, no, it was great. No, me and Alana talked all the way up until shooting. So the day we, uh, the the first time that we read together all the way pretty much up till shooting, we talked pretty much every day just to like get to know each other. And um, it was, I, we kept saying to each other, thank God we have each other. Because if I didn't have someone to be like, what, what am I doing? You know, it, it, it wouldn't have been as easy. It wouldn't have been as nice to show up to work every day. You know, it was, it was a necessity almost. Yeah, it's got to be fascinating, Alana, because, I mean, I've heard you joke that you thought you were going to get fired every day. And maybe that's not a joke. Maybe that's actually how you felt. Um, but I would imagine, like, you want to be vulnerable to your director and let him know in this case, oh, I'm not feeling so sure about this. But at the same time, you don't want to let all your insecurities show because you want him to be confident in you. So how did you balance all that? You know, it's a funny thing. And I've been thinking about it a lot recently is I had the same feeling on set as I do right before I'm about to perform with my band. And before the show starts, I have incredible insecurities, like all the worst thoughts that you can think go through my mind. Like, how am I doing this? What, what's going to happen? And then the second that the show starts, this weird rush, this wave of focus and uh, calm just kind of rushes over me. And I felt the same way on set. I mean, talking about Bradley, I mean, that was, again, chaos. I mean, it was full John Peter's chaos. I was so nervous. I, was, I had never done this before. All those bad thoughts kind of kept going through my mind. And then, you know, you hear action and that same wave of calm and focus kind of rushed over me and I was in. And it's like this weird trance that you kind of go through and then you hear cut. And also, I mean, I had Paul. I mean, every time that I had these thoughts, I knew that Paul had zero thoughts, zero doubt in me. He knew I could do this way before I knew I could do it. And when you have support like that, you really can accomplish anything. You really can. Sure. And listen, I go back. I've watched a couple of the Heim videos that Paul has directed since seeing the movie. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, they're <laughs> an actress. I get it now. And like, I even I recognize the Alana from this movie in some of your shots in the in the videos. Absolutely. So I can totally see why, Paul, you, you, oh, thank you. spotted that. I got that that eye for I got that eye, Dave, that eye for talent that, you know, <laughs> not since Louis B. Mayer. No, I I, re I mean, it's funny to hear Alana talk about her insecurities, you know, because um, I didn't have any. And and I'm I have to be that final word that I'm watching what's happening. But there's absolutely no way to cure um, the insecurities that she's going to have or Cooper's going to have or even Bradley. I'm sure at this point you sort of walk away from something, you hypnotize yourself at its best. You get into this complete sort of fugue state as an actor at its best. And when you sort of sober up and it's late at night and you're trying to go to bed, you go, wait, what, what the hell did I just do? You have to have that insecurity. You can't, you know, if an actor's going to bed at night going, I nailed it. There's probably some cause for concern. You have to always be questioning and be hungry. And then, but if, if I'm there and I'm, you know, quietly confident that I'm seeing what I'm seeing, which quite honestly, with all of them from time to time, I was so overwhelmed um, to tell them this to their face finally, that I was so overwhelmed at how good it was that of course it did set alarm bells off. You have to go like, hang on a minute. I'm getting way overconfident right now. This feels incredibly strong to me. You know, <laughs> there's gotta be something wrong. I've been doing this for over 20 years and, and I don't know if I've ever felt so trusting uh, on set with a director before. And the privilege I felt on that set was so filled me with so much joy that I was actually there working on a Paul Thomas Anderson movie it was so overwhelming to me that I'm sure you guys felt the same way that I was just like 
I'm going to soak up every single second of it. I'm not even thinking about the result, like that I'm here. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and this man is here who I trust. That's something that I think Paul like can't control. It's this gift that, that he has that like the people that come and work with him uh, just by his presence on set, I think takes away something that allows them just to be creative and just to uh, uh, allow them to just explore. The thing that all really brought us together, I don't know if you all remember this, but you remember there's like that one moment where it almost felt like I was kind of watching John Peters too. And then we'd all like regroup after the take and like laugh about it without like, what did he, what just happened? But there was, you remember that one moment, Cooper, when like John Peter goes like, this mother blow dries, talking yeah, yeah, about right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Literally, we literally, like I'm asking him how many, how many blow dries he's done yeah, last yeah. year. <laughs> like, we couldn't stop laughing, like all of yeah. us. And like Paul didn't go like cut. And, you know, it was all like, I don't know. We were all just like witnessing something. And I, and I, I see that in all of his movies that I've ever watched from Heart Eight to this, that there is that magic. And it's because of the way he is a, as an artist. I love, Bradley, that you feel like you were able to be present on the set, enjoying the moment, but at the same time delivering this performance that is so a completely different person I, that's that's great that you were able to do both of those things, enjoy the moment and also deliver uh, in, a, in a professional context. I think that's also because of prep. I mean, this is a small role. He and I, you know, we went to that location, I don't know, three times with Adam Sumner, you know, talked about John, talked about all these things, worked intimately with Mark Bridges, it, it, creating that outfit that Mark came up with, with Paul, you know, so it was like, there was a lot of prep that went into this, even though it was small, we, we really, um, I was, I mean, I was basically living with Paul for three weeks. Like he showed me all the camera tests, lenses, everything. I just soaked everything up. That's great. Mark, I was just, before we logged on, I did a Google search for John Peters and I found this picture that ended up being John Peters in the white outfit with the necklace with Barbara Streisand and next to him. And I looked at the picture of Small and I said, oh, how funny. Someone took a picture of Bradley Cooper in character and like, and photoshopped Barbara Streisand onto it. And I was like, oh no, that's actually John Peters. I mean, it's just crazy what you and the hair and makeup people were able to do. Can you tell me a little bit about how you, how you and Paul chose that now iconic white outfit to, to be the one that he would wear and then how you either sourced it or made it. Yeah, I was looking uh, for images of John Peters and Barbara and I happened to see, there was one picture of him with a printed shirt and a plaid jacket and some jeans because they're going to the movies and I'm thinking, okay, this, this works. And I also found the white one and ran it by Paul and he liked both of them. So uh, I acquired, vintage pieces that could kind of mock up what we were doing. And uh, there were a couple of other costume thoughts. We were first seeing John Peters working out with his assistant and, and then change his clothes into the white outfit. Even Bradley, you mentioned the other day, I think it was good that we just stuck with one, one piece. And I, we did the fitting. We all got jazzed about these prototype pieces. I sent pictures over to Paul and he, it was a winner. I think those, the two of them talked about it. Everybody was just like done, it's hilarious. Let's just go with it. Paul loves to use original pieces. You know, there's a practical aspect to that, that I felt like he needed to have some multiples because he was working all night in a white outfit. So, um, we, I took it to my shirt guy in Anto, Beverly Hills, and they copied, they made three copies. They figured out the embroidery, they made it. And then we made extra trousers and things because I just, I wanted to be able to sleep while they were shooting, not worrying that Paul had one tissue paper thin white shirt out there on Ventura Boulevard. But I never told Paul. I was like, here you go. And then... <laughs> knowing that he was covered and then the last day when we were we were out there after the fights and the you know thing he, Paul's like maybe we should rip this maybe we should put some blood on it and I was like yeah go ahead sure it's great because um, I knew he was covered and we could go back and we could do anything so it's it's really as always and this is the process with Paul is we get the idea try to get real clothes to put on the actor and then look at it and decide and think about it. And then, and it's really 
a process that we do. I give him a few options on things, hopefully. And, and then he can really see what feels best for him. Most great collaborators that you work with at a certain point, when you say, I only need one outfit, I only need just, I'm telling you, don't even bother. Don't spend the money. <laughs> they will nod to your face, go, you got it. And then make three extras behind your back. It's like, you know, anybody in the camera department, you say, I'm telling you, just bring one lens in your pocket, bring the 18. That's all we're using. And the people who work with you bring, we're bringing the 45, bring the 35. This, uh, you know, we know how this goes. And it's, it, that's the joy of working with, Oh, the people are having this collaboration is they, we all know each other, you know, it's a great lesson. And listen, three rosebud sleds in citizen Kane, three <laughs> John Peter shirts. Absolutely. For licorice beets, I guess. Yeah. And those boots too, that you didn't see those boots that, 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 that informed the walk. <laughs> okay, I'm sure. Bradley, obviously you're well-versed in John Peters era, you know, Barbara Streisand, John Peters, that whole thing. You even, I think, probably had some business dealings with him during A Star is Born, but I don't get the sense that you ever got to know him well. Did you go down a John Peters rabbit hole or what, what did you find most helpful? Uh, I, I, Paul, Paul started sending me some videos from that time period and I just did a dive on that and it really, and it was just sort of his rhythms. There were some interviews he did with Christopherson and Barbara Streisand during the promotion of A Star is Born. Uh, There's a couple other things I kept watching. He talked about sort of maybe raising my voice a little bit. I just, I love that idea of um, just this like gentle voice, but he's a complete monster, you know? He's like, hey fellas, like that's the intro, you know? <laughs> Out of that, and it just sort of all went scooch over. <laughs> <laughs> that helped a lot, and uh, yeah, it was just sort of finding that. Uh, really, it's always about the voice for me. Uh, that's always the way in, and uh, that that sort of gentle and the, the rhythm with which they sort of he sort of and many people like men spoke in that time period, uh, especially like when we were in the truck. All that sort of the way he's talking to the two of them and asking her questions. That all sort of came out of watching those videos and the way that his sort of rhythms. If you'll pardon the question that just seems so obvious, have you heard from him? From John Peters? Yeah, he's, he's, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, he definitely sent a text. I got to know him because he's the reason I was able to star as one. He deferred his grandfather fee, and I would never have been able to make that movie if he didn't do that. So what did he say? Great job. Let's keep going kind of thing. I think he's happy. I think he's thrilled. Of course he is. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um Cooper, did you have conversations with Gary Getzman? How did how did you find your way into understanding Gary at this at this age? I met him one time on set, and and Paul's like, he's here, and I was like, who's here? And then he kind of came walking out. I was like, oh my god, it's him. There were some videos that I watched of kind of you know the commercials, and um, I watched some of his movies that he was in at this kind of time, um, and that was kind of all it really was to know what he was like at that age. But then it was kind of more talking to Paul to figure out what he wanted from the character at this age. It, it, it's, it's based off Gary Getzman and some of the stories he's told Paul, but it, it's not him. You know, it's not, it's, it's not directly him. It's, his name's Gary Valentine, you know. Alana, what did it mean for you to not only be doing this film, but to be doing it with your two sisters and your mom and dad. I mean, those days, did they feel extra special when, when your whole family was there? It felt very weird because at that point we had been filming, I think for a month. So I was, I kind of had this rhythm going. I had all this confidence and Paul laughs. Cause I think that that morning before they showed up to set, Paul kind of like took me aside and said like, today's going to be different your family's coming. And I didn't realize until we were all sitting down and I kind of reverted back to the baby of the family. I, I felt like for the longest time, I was this very confident older sister. And then my actual sisters showed up and I reverted back to where I was in the hierarchy. Um, and I was constantly being like, you know, you've got to be period guys. Don't embarrass me. <laughs> I was so, you know, nervous about you know what was my dad gonna do because my dad is I mean Alana is unpredictable Alana Kane is very unpredictable but Moti Kane is probably the most unpredictable but it was great I mean we sat down and and a lot of that was just my dad you know had what my dad would do at Shabbat dinner if I brought an atheist that was very much just what would happen and what did happen in real life um, but it was great. I loved working with my family. I liked it better when they left because then I could go back to my confident self, but it was great having them there for the time being. 
Yeah. Paul, let me end with you because I, I think one of the things that's so remarkable about this movie is just the overall energy of it. And it, it lives in the pacing, in the performances, in the shots, in, in so many things. It just has this great feeling, very evocative of the time and place. How did you go about from the start of this whole process, when you first started typing it out, to finishing up in the editing room, to make sure that you were happy with the energy of the film? That's a nice question and a nice compliment. There were so many stories that, that, um, that I felt like I was writing, things that I wanted to get in there, that I felt I was adapting a book in a way. So there was, it needed uh, the type of energy to cover the ground um, that, that I thought was necessary to tell the fullest version of the story. Um, the momentum um, comes from the characters. You know, if you have at the center of it, the, the, the youthfulness of, of Gary and Alana, that's going to give you momentum. You know, if you can remember back to being an adolescent, you know, you, you have energy and enthusiasm that's boundless. And, and, and it's, and it's generally, it, it's generally very short as well. It's kind of, you're interested in one thing for 15 minutes, you're interested in another thing for 10 minutes and you keep bouncing around. Um, so keeping that energy alive um, was, was critical he was just trying to do Billy Wild, what Billy Wilder would have done, you know, keep it bouncing, keep it moving. Don't linger. Um, don't put a hat on top of a hat. And the accumulation of all of these events will give you your story. You know, your story won't be found in one scene. Your story will be found once the journey from A to, to Z has been completed. And that was something that he always did so well and effortlessly during the writing while we were shooting while we were editing that was constantly nagging at us keep the energy alive keep the pace moving um get to the end well it paid off congratulations to all of you it's so nice to just spend some time and and to see all of the uh, affinity between all five of you so mark and alana and cooper and bradley and paul thank you so much for taking some time and thanks to you all for thank, you, thank dave. you thank you bye You're the best. thanks dave thanks, bye guys bye.